easy. Hold that. So I'm the founder of noco2.org. Um, we make it easy for people to take action. We plant trees, um, plant lots of trees, and you can remove all of your carbon footprint. So to date, we've planted 400,000 trees, which will remove 2,000 tons of CO2 for every year that those trees are growing. So introductions. First of all, big thank you to Gary for making this possible. Gary, we could not be doing this without yourself. So thank you, Gary. And um, I'd like to invite people to um, make a short introduction to themselves. So um, who'd like to start? Elise, would you like to start? Sure, thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Elise Beckel. I'm actually from France and my husband is from Canada, but we've been living here in Switzerland for 14 years. Um, I'm an uh, advisor to the, the United Nations. I'm working on the UN Food System Summit. You might know that the Secretary General is hosting a, a summit on food, on food systems, which is actually connecting climate, people, and nature in a very uh, important way this year, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic and very big issues in terms of food security for people around the world. I'm also the founder and president of Climate and Sustainability, which is a platform of collaboration to accelerate climate action. Our vision is around radical collaboration. So facilitating partnership building, bringing together the UN government companies and civil society to accelerate climate action. And I'm now also the deputy mayor in my hometown here in Switzerland. I've recently been elected um, as a member of the executive office for the Green Party uh, and I will be responsible for energy and human resources and as you know the, the politics in Switzerland are quite challenging right now. Uh, very happy to be here with all of you and Charles thank you for inviting us and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, tree planting is really really important and such a such an easy solution we need to scale it up and make it happen with a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you for your support. So who'd like to go next? Jenny? Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Chapman. Uh, I'm the head of sustainability um, at a school in North London. And through that, um, I've become the chair of the London Schools Eco Network, which is a collection of um, London schools working together um, to bring about um, climate action. Uh, I'm also on the committee of the London Population Matters Group, uh, which is a charity, uh, environmental charity, looking at um, ensuring a sustainable human population. Um, I'm also just generally extremely interested in all environmental issues. Myself, I'm a biologist by training, um, and I have a lifelong interest um, in the natural world. Okay, who's next? Ilan, would you like to go next? Hello, I'm Ilan. I'm a scientist at University College London, where I'm in the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction and the Institute for Global Health. I'm also connected with the University of Agder in Southern Norway. And at UCL University College London, I teach on our master's program. So we have a master's of disasters and also master's of global health. My modules are climate change and health and conflict, humanitarianism and disasters. Thanks to Gary. Thanks to Charles. Thank you. Pete? Hi, I'm Pete Denny. Uh, I'm the founder of Potential Climate Ventures, which is a climate VC. So we, we believe that a lot of the solutions needed to fix the climate emergency have been invented yet. And maybe they're on the cusp of being invented. Or they've been invented, but they haven't been brought to market yet. And that the world is full of incredible entrepreneurs who are on the cusp of doing these things. So our, our mission is to find them whether they're doing early stage crazy things or not, and to, and to nurture them and to fund them and to help them get to the next stage. So Stefan, have you ever had such a great introduction? Because you're an entrepreneur. So tell us about your being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so well, we, we started out with Charles um, at Club 21, wondering about the climate change and decided to co-found uh, Saving Our Planet and later No CO2. Um, that's to create um, a first uh, natural carbon, uh, artificial carbon sink in tree planting. And then uh, a few months later, I found out that we needed to create another artificial carbon sink in, uh, in the carbon negative materials. And uh, so I co-founded Techno Carbon, of which I am the president uh, now. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. 
Okay, so let's just set the scene for our discussion today. So as I say, this is the sixth of these webinars about 1.5. The first of these webinars, Gary, if you remember, uh, you were here, um, was on the 15th of January this year, and we talked about what we want from COP26. So for me, all the way through, top of my list, and including in January, was to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees max. So even though at that time we knew Joe Biden was gonna be president, president, I was still worried that 1.5 might be too big a step for COP26. But here we are today, uh, only five months on, and at this meeting in Cornwall just over the weekend, uh, we've maybe made an important stepping stone. So the G7 meeting in Cornwall has actually agreed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, the G7 is not the G20, it's not COP26, but what, a, uh, what an amazing progress over, over, those, over those five months to get to where we are now. So many people want to stop global warming and they want to know to, they want to do something about it. And in the context of what's happened at the G7, I think it's a very, very interesting question to ask actually what is the best thing for people to do? And that's what we're here to talk about today. But first of all, let's take a quick question. So have we reached the tipping point? So by this, what I mean is we've had a whole lot of time, a whole lot of discussion uh, about whether the world is going to take action to stop global warming. So have we actually reached that tipping point of now the world saying, yes, we are going to do something to take action to stop global warming? So quick question, quick poll around the table. Who wants to, um, who wants to go first on that one? Jenny, you're smiling. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, of course, there's we're talking about two tipping points here. We're talking about the climate tipping point and the possibility of a um, an Earth going to runaway um, heating scenario. Um, in terms of that, we don't know where that's going to be. It, we might have already passed it, so we just need to do everything we can. Um, in my opinion, I think. A really important message to get across is that climate change isn't something that we win or lose. It's not this binary um, uh, outcome. Therefore, everything that any, everyone can do is really important. Um, but going back to the G7, I think, um, have we have we reached this tipping point of, of, sort of consensus? Well, I think it's similar to where we were with smoking, perhaps. If we, we're now at the situation where I think everyone can see that this is a terrible situation. We know what we've got to do about it. We just need the will. We need that to come from the top down. We need that to come from the bottom up. And I don't think that pledges are enough. Pledges are not policy. And if we look at the, um, if we, uh, the Climate Action Tracker had a look at the uh, um, warming scenarios, um, if we um, take the pledges into account, and that's between 1.6 and 2.6 degrees heating, which is above the 1.5 that we need to keep below, and obviously below that if possible. Um, and if we look at the actual policy that's, that's um, been uh, signed off, that's mm -hmm. between 2.1 and 3.9 degrees. So I think from G7, commitment isn't a strong enough word. Okay, great. Who's next? Elise. I can go next. And actually, I think it's really important, as Jenny just said, to talk about uh, the scientific tipping points. And I do think that we are actually reaching these tipping points now. Um, I'm very concerned. I'm very pessimistic in terms of the science of where we are. You may have seen uh, this latest documentary, uh, Breaking Boundaries. If you haven't seen it, please do watch it. Uh, with the scientist uh, Johan Rockström. We work with him on the Planetary Emergency Partnership. And, um, and he's clearly showing that there are nine planetary boundaries that we have to respect. And uh, three of them are climate change, biodiversity, and, and water. And we are clearly uh, breaking the boundaries there in terms of feedback loops. Um, this is what we're seeing right now in the Amazon the Amazon forest might turn into a savanna uh, by 2050. We see also um, uh, massive uh, forest uh, fires in Australia. I was actually there myself, so I saw the amount of destruction happening there in Australia. And this is actually when I came back from that trip that I thought that the UN was just too slow and I decided to create this platform of collaboration, climate and sustainability. 
So forests are actually starting to release more carbon than, than they are absorbing. The oceans are warmer and more getting more acidic, which means that they can't be absorbing that much heat anymore and they can't be absorbing that much carbon anymore. And as you know, also the ice is melting uh, in the Arctic and in, in Antarctica. So there is less albedo effect. So the, the, the water is now darker, it's not white anymore, which means that uh, the earth is absorbing even more heat. So there is clearly an acceleration of climate change. And I think this is really, really worrying. So that's answering your question on the first point. Mm. In terms of the political situation, I'm, I'm actually more optimistic on that because I think the solutions are in front of us. And what we need is the political leadership and the finance, of course, to unlock these solutions and to scale them up. And uh, the G7 outcomes are very positive. I know that there are people from Extinction Rebellion that say that it was not good enough. And of course, the challenge with the G7, but also with the G20, is that um, these heads of states have a lot of political influence because they represent the largest economies around the world but it's not legally binding. So it's not like the UN. And this is why what is happening right now in the G7, it's very, very important that this is first going to the G20 uh, to get the support from the global South, but also it needs to be embedded into the UN process uh, on the CBD negotiations on biodiversity for CBD COP15 that will be hosted by China. And of course, COP26 in Glasgow. And I think that uh, the key takeaways for me are, there are three key takeaways. One is that heads of states uh, committed to protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030. So this is what we call the 30 by 30 target on biodiversity. And I think this is actually the most significant achievement and it matters for climate because uh, without forests and oceans, there's no way we can solve the climate crisis. We need nature on our side uh, to solve the climate crisis. Nature-based solutions can deliver at least a third of uh, the carbon emission reduction we have to achieve to stay within 1.5 uh, degree as, as it's in the Paris Agreement. Um, now, of course, this 30 by 30 target needs to be um, adopted by the G20 and it needs to go to the CBD COP, the, the, the COP that is dealing with biodiversity uh, in China, as I said before. The second one is reducing carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. It's not that new because in a way the EU is already there, uh, but I think it's important for all of the G7 to be adopting that. And this commitment was not possible six months ago when President Trump was still in office. So this is a massive change. And I think we tend to forget about the positive news. Um, and the other one is uh, phasing out fossil fuels, in particular, uh, stopping uh, funding for coal. And that's also a, a very significant shift because until now it was mainly supported by ministers of environment and climate and not by heads of states. And so the fact that these three targets, so protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030 on nature, uh, reducing carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, and this is preparing for carbon neutrality by 2050, and phasing out fossil fuel funding. These are three achievements uh, that were not possible, as I said, a few months back. Now the challenge will be to, to get that to the G20, because of course we have Bolsonaro in Brazil and Putin in Russia that will be uh, doing everything they can to, to block that. But this is a major achievement. So just to, to kind of summarize, I'm very concerned in terms of the climate science and the tipping points on, on what's happening around the world, but positive in terms of what's happening at the global level on climate policy. Okay, thank you very much. So who'd like to go next? Um, Pete, do you want to go next? So you, we, we spoke about the, the, the tipping point, which is approaching where it's, it's too late to do anything. And Charles, you were asking about whether we're, we're seeing another tipping point in, in, in change in, in public behaviour and, and public opinion. And I, it feels to me as though we are, and I don't know whether that's kind of confirmation bias because I'm, I'm in this space and I'm meeting with amazing people who are doing amazing things. But the right, and if, if it is happening, I still don't believe it's happening quickly enough. You know, we, we need to go faster. We need to change our behaviours faster and, and do things which are uncomfortable. But some, some great things have really started to happen. So, so Chris Yoon, um, 
towards the end of last year, he's a he's a very large, very successful hedge fund manager, started to say that we require a vote on boards to for the climate. Somebody needs to represent the climate and speak the voice of the climate at, at board meetings. Um, a bit later on, um, in fact, more, more recently, the Larry Fink, who's the CEO of, of BlackRock, said that um, they won't invest in companies that don't have a credible plan to, to get to net zero. Um, that's an amazing signal. What an amazing signal that is. <clears throat> and then some genius has come up with the idea of gamifying the race to zero hashtag race to zero. What an amazing idea that is. So now, now you've got the, the UK government saying, right, no, no, new, no new fossil fuel, no new in, internal combustion engines by 2035, because this has been positioned in the public mind as a race. You've got people like Jag Jagger Land Rover, who's a UK auto manufacturer, saying, we'll do it by 2030 as like a challenge to the rest of the auto industry to see can we do it faster. And it's starting to be um, <clears throat> a PR stunt, you know, in a good way that, that you're, you're, you're saying we, we, we're going to make as a company, we're going to make radical difference. So I think there's change happening. It needs to go faster. But I think there is some good news in that respect. Super. OK, Stefan, what do you think? Yeah, so so that, that's that's a great actually situation where the, the find ourselves in uh, just a few months before COP26. We don't need to talk about whether climate change is real, whether people agree or not. And I I, I see a, a reaction in the discussion, which is okay. It, it would save much time if the panelists took it as a given that we accept the fact of climate change. And what are the realistic measures? I, th I think that's a great question, uh, and that's a great way to put it, which is, okay, where is the plan? Um, okay, we all agree we need to move faster. Uh, it's great to gamify uh, the race, and I completely agree with that, Pete. That's great. Um, how do we do it? Um, and how do we achieve impact? And what is impact? Define, define what are the most efficient ways. So th there is the first step was really get everyone on board, and start moving in the right direction. That's not completely achieved. That's well underway. Then, how do we maximize the efficiency? How do we win the the race? Because you no, know, we have a tight carbon budget to spend before uh, climate change, uh, runaway climate change uh, hits. And runaway climate change is something we want definitely to avoid. This is why G7 declared. Uh, that we need to respect the limits of 1.5 C global warming. So yeah, I think you and I, Charles, we've spent a lot of time and, and I think our, our uh, press release at COP22 and COP23 uh, were, were giving some hints about what are the 10 uh, most efficient climate actions or what are the 12 measures, seven uh, individual, five um, collective that we can all take in order to achieve uh, impact and and uh, and have the best efficiency uh, during this race against the clock. Sure. So so the, these topics have been covered. Now we need to to bring the word out. How do we tell people? Okay, the, these are the massively most impactful measures that you can take or that you can ask your elected representatives. Uh, to, to take and and we, we so we've had plenty of these discussions it's time now to act uh, if people have questions I, I'd be happy to, to to reply I don't want to delve into the details now but we we roughly know what needs to be done to have impact win the race and, and get things done okay so I want to give a big thank you here to Elise for helping set the scene with your um, very comprehensive and uh, succinct analysis but uh, now over to over to Ilan what's your what's your take on this Ilan well thank you wonderful comments from the others fundamentally the question is are we at tipping points and as the others rightly did they separated some of them in general my answer agrees with the others no politically yeah, it was helpful to have some aspects of the G7 come forth from Cornwall, but there were so many more which really didn't help. And exactly as was said, pledges do not necessarily mean action, which is exactly what the comment in the chat is about, what can we do? So it's all very well for seven people who are unrepresentative of the world to come to the UK and declare this. Japan has an election this year. Germany has an election this year, which may end up with a green chancellor. There's a good chance, but it may not. France has an election next year. 
the U.S. is already thinking towards the midterms, where if the Democrats get wiped out in both the Senate and the House, then whoever is president is not going to have a very happy time. Canada could go into an election at any point, and the previous campaigns have shown that even though the current prime minister is likely on track for majority, election campaigns do matter in Canada and can shift very quickly. So whatever these seven individuals agreed to recently does not necessarily hold for the next year or the next two years. In terms of the science, and this is where I really think we need practical action, we have to get the science right. And the only tipping point that I see in the science is actually supporting inappropriate research. And I'm very sorry to say planetary boundaries comes within that. There are so many problems, there are so many difficulties, it is so retrogressive in so many ways that myself and many of the people who I work with just don't want to deal with planetary boundaries. It does not make sense, it does not help, there are technical problems, there are social problems, and it actually does not take into account what we know about the science. So we actually want to avoid planetary boundaries and have a tipping point towards what is good, robust, helpful science. Some of which actually came up with a question here um, which is saying, well, what does it mean to protect 30% of land by 2030? How do we determine that? And the questions in that Q&A are exactly the point. This is where we can bring real science, good science, appropriate science, to move forward in such a way that we create the tipping point towards accuracy and towards facts to come up with the practical actions which are quite rightly demanded in the chat based on actually appropriate and useful science. So I'd say, well, what does this mean? It's up to us. We have to create the change. We have to vote for people who we think are appropriate. And we've both spoken about Switzerland and vote in certain ways that we want to go forward. But there also comes a time when we say, you know what? Why don't we take inspiration from those on the ground who are actually acting, who are doing it, who are teaching me what I need to know, teaching me what I need to do. Let's give less airtime to the G7, more airtime to, you know, no CO2, for example, planting trees. Um, and then there's another Q&A saying, well, what, what happens when we soon have to feed, have twice as many people to feed? Well, then let's work to ensure we don't have twice as many people to feed. To recognize that numbers of people is not the only factor, but it is a factor that has to be addressed tangible action. Consumption per person is also part of it. Tangible action. So again, I'd say, what can we do together? What can we learn from people who are doing this? And this is how we create the tipping points that we want. Well, okay. Well, look, um, Ilan, if you're not happy with the planetary boundaries, um, do, you, do you want to um, ideally pop in the chat some references to things that you you prefer so we can we can look at those um very happy to to, to look at those and talk more about that but say it would be helpful if you could do that okay so elan i think you've really set the scene here um we we started off you know we we started off quite positively and then we've got a whole load of issues that come out already um and we're only just into uh half an hour of discussion. So look, let's go to the big question and put it very simply is this. There's a lot of people out there who are saying, I want to stop global warming. Given all of this stuff, what can I do to help? So I'd like, uh, I'd like us, this is the main subject of what we're talking about. I'd like to, to go around, um, we can have a couple of rounds of discussion if people have got ideas. Um, um, I certainly want Elise to talk about the, uh, some of the experiences from Switzerland, but before we get into that, let's, let's just start off generally. Um, what sort of thing can we do actually to help? So to advise somebody, there's people on the line here, um, what, uh, uh, what, what can people do to help? So who would like to, who'd like to volunteer to, uh, to start? I'll start. Um, I think oh, you're going to start. Okay. Yes, I'm going to start. Okay. I think that it's, uh, I mean, really good point, Ilan, that what we need is uh, change, both on the inside and on the outside. So you've got the, the top down policy making where you need, um, ba basically, you need people that care about climate change uh, in uh, presidential positions, ministerial positions. Um, so I'm probably a bit biased because I'm, I'm from the Green Party, but I do think right now this is the best bet and also having more women, I must say, 
can also make a big change. And, um, and you need the bottom up pressure for sure. So you need the pressure from the inside of the system and from the outside. And it's really, really important for everyone. So I think you can also go to politics in your local community, in your hometown. It's very important that younger people do that as well, the younger generation, uh, because this is how the change will happen. And, um, and on the outside, there is this very, very interesting study. If you get 3.5% of the population to care about a topic, it can really change the whole narrative. So I think it's also really important that you talk to people in your community, in your family, your friends, in your school, in your workplace, in your university, everywhere um, to, to really mobilize people. And um, um, I would not underestimate these, uh, these things, these small steps you can take in your community where you are. I think everyone can become a climate leader. And uh, so I would keep this kind of hopeful message that uh, we should all be acting in the right direction. And yes, of course, do vote. Um, if you can't get uh, elected yourself or if you can't get into politics, uh, do vote for the right people, support people who are there campaigning, do protest on the street as well. I think this is very important. I mean, what Greta has done had a huge influence including here in Switzerland, because without that support, we would not even have had a, a CO2 legislation for a vote. Um, and I think what is also very important is to try to speak, people, speak to people who don't agree with you. And this is the biggest lesson for us here in Switzerland, because we tend to stay within our cozy communities. Uh, if you look at the polls, uh, people in cities, they all voted yes here in my, in my hometown there was a 62% vote for the yes on the CO2 legislation. But the people who are out there in the mountains, in rural areas or in poorest communities, they voted no because they were afraid. And I think they were of course also manipulated by the extreme right, by this rise of populism, this populist movement saying, you know, this political elite, they just want you to pay more tax, so don't vote for it. And it's such a shame because actually the CO2 legislation here in Switzerland was designed to support the poorest people. There was a redistribution mechanism with the tax on aviation, on airplane ticket that was going to support poor people to replace their heating system also with their medical insurance and their um, uh, social security uh, savings. And that well, message- Elise, let's, come back, let's come yes, back to that yes. in a minute because we've got, um, that's an important whole question, right? But um, I want to say, um, great point you've made about everyone becoming a climate leader, and that's certainly what we're what we're trying to do here. I mean, you know, everyone here has got the opportunity of being a climate leader. Uh, Gary and myself having a lot of fun with this. We've had two groups of young people, and um, people. It's clear people aged 16, 17 actually are incredibly articulate on this subject, and we want them back again in in July. But OK, after that, so who'd like to uh, who'd like to go next? And we'll come back, at least to the uh, the cost uh, situation in, in a bit. So, Jenny, OK, off you go. Uh, so when I'm asked what can individuals do, um, I think there's there's five things. Um, number one, move your money. So if you um, invest, invest money in a high street bank or in your pension, you are most likely funding fossil fuels and climate destruction, modern slavery and all sorts of hideous other things. Um, the great thing about this action, you do it once, it lasts a lifetime. So look where your money is in your pensions, in your bank, move it. Um, number two, stop flying. Flying is a planet destroying luxury. Stop it decarbonize your transport as best you can, um, and also your energy supplier. Um, number three, eat plants. Do this for health reasons, do this for biodiversity reasons in terms of land use, do this for climate reasons, and do this to stop future pandemics. Number four, small families. Um, there's a couple of comments in the chat. All environmental problems are ultimately harder to solve with more people, and the more people we have on the planet, that we want to have a, a good quality of life, the harder that is to reach our climate goals. And number five, um, echoing what Elise said, vote. Okay, so who's next, Pete? I wish you'd gone before Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> And can, can I can I um, just expand on on one of them? Uh, move move your money. I think this, this is I mean this is primordial, which I think is why why you mentioned it first. I, I worked in the pensions industry for, for a long time, 
And um, there, were, there were two things that I noticed. One is the amount of money invested in UK pensions is enormous. It's trillions, literally trillions. Um, and there's three trillion of that that can be moved around so you can choose where it goes. Um, and most, most people, this is the second thing that I noticed, don't engage with their pensions at all because they think a lot of people think it's like a tax. My employer takes it out and I don't get to ever see it again. It's actually your money. So you are an investor. If you've got a full-time job, if you've ever had a full-time job, you are an investor. And uh, Mark Carney uh, uses this really nice example of um, uh, a, a doctor, uh, a cancer doctor, oncologist in, in, um, in Australia who looked at where her money was being invested in her pension. And she discovered it was invested in tobacco companies. And she realized, wow, I've probably killed more people through my investments than I've saved through, through my work as a doctor. So he makes this whole point. Make sure that your investments are invested in the place where your convictions lie. Um, and so a good place to, to follow up on this is his website, makeyourmoneymatter.com. You, it shows you how to pester your, uh, your employer. Your employer is responsible for this. Find out where it's invested and, you know, and, and get your friends to make sure that it's changed. Okay. Um, Stefan, do you want to, you want to go next? Yes. Well, I wanted to second on, on what Jenny uh, and Pete um, said um, uh, about the, the, the solution. So uh, I, I would quickly go, go through the, 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 the climate solutions we, we have defined at Saving Our Planet, uh, which are, which are a uh, go carbon neutral by planting trees. So th there was a question about, oh, yes, that trees take a lot of time to grow and so on. But uh, in fact, we are doing that in, in places where uh, this is effective very fast. And, and it does last only for, for the time, uh, not only for the time the, the trees are growing, but also when they are grown, they still continue capturing CO2 because a tree doesn't, doesn't only grow in height, but it also grows in width. So you, you may have the intuition or the impression that uh, a tree stops capturing CO2 when, when it has reached its adult height, but that's not true. The tree does continue to store CO2 far, uh, for, for a long time after it has reached its adult size. Um, and uh, also there is one thing what you can do is overcompensate. So you can, instead of buying one tree to compensate for your emissions, you can buy two and that's not expensive. And okay, but so what is the problem? What does, why doesn't everybody do that? First, everybody doesn't have the money to do this, but also there is not enough land area available to grow trees uh, to do that for everybody. In fact, it is limited to about 700 million people. So the first 700 million people who do it actually contribute. And then we need to find other solutions for the remaining seven billion, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so the, the other solutions are to to protect and support all the anti deforestation campaigns. We don't have enough support for that. Deforestation is still uh, growing, uh, and that's one of the major threats to the climate and ecosystems because we are actually destroying the major carbon sink, which is forests. Uh, same goes for the ocean, of course. Um, the third solution is switch to clean energy, clean electricity, heat pumps, uh, solar power, uh, nuclear power when you have it, wind. Uh, these are all good solutions to replace coal and fossil fuels in general. Electric vehicles and the electric motors, that's usage. So that's, that has to be financed. And I'll come back to that uh, when I address the next question, which is, okay, how, what, what do we do for people who don't have enough money? Uh, of course, okay, eat, pla eat more plants and less animals, that, that's, that's a given. Um, and also uh, try to monitor your CO2 emissions so that you can actually assess whether you have reduced or not. So that's, that's, that's also part of education and talk about it. You know, the, the worst thing you can do about climate change is not talk about it. So talk about it, talk about how you save CO2 with your friends, with your family, of course, with your children if you have, or, or, or your nephews and uh, or your uh, neighbor's children, although some have um, um, provisions about that. And um, also, yeah, um, we manage population growth. There, there, no, there, there, are, there are a lot of uh, UN, uh, UN plans, and I'm sure um, our fellows here will, uh, can talk more about this. So these are individual actions. This is what you can do at your level. And now there are five actions 
at collective level, but you must ask your elected representatives if you live in a democracy or your uh, ruling party member if you don't live in a, a democracy um, to, to do so. Uh, so the, the, so demand that governments commit to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees maximum. We wrote that three years ago. Hey, there we are. So that's basically done. Uh, they've declared they would do it. Now we need to hold them accountable. And so the, the, the issue is climate accountability. Um, the, the ninth measure is require the government to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity generation and domestic gas. Um, so there are numbers and thresholds to, for that. Require that governments put in place carbon pricing. Um, so I, I'm actually a co-founder of, Citizen, of Citizens Climate Lobby France, uh, where we propose to have a climate income. That would be an income based on carbon pricing. And that's a way to alleviate uh, the, the burden of the carbon tax on, uh, on the, the, the less wealthy people. And then require that governments electrify transport by 2030 rather than, tw than by 2040. So two years ago, it, we, people were still talking about 2040. And now we have more and more governments saying, okay, 2040 is 20 years ago. That's too slow. We need to hasten the pace and uh, switch to electric uh, vehicles by 2030. And then the, the last measure was require the gov government to reduce CO2 emissions from buildings, industrial processes, and building materials, and support research into CO2 capture and storage. And there are several ways to do this, but if you pay a lot of money to pump CO2 into the ground and do nothing with it, there probably won't be enough money in the world to, to do that efficiently. Mm -hmm. So uh, a more clever way to do that is to actually create things with the CO2 we got captured. This requires energy, so this should be low carbon energy. It doesn't come for free, but uh, there are business models and uh, startups which are developing the technology to make this profitable, both in an economic sense and an environmental sense. Okay, so I'm going to ask some hard questions in a minute, but um, let's have uh, let's have Elan comment first, please. So no wonderful ideas and great to see these in the chat. I'm going to focus on individual and local, not because I think it's the number one, but just to think about what else we can do. And a lot of it is looking at what do we consume? What do I consume? Can I actually buy 10% less in a year? I did it. It was remarkable how easy it was and I actually far exceeded the 10%. And then you can go another 10% and another 10%. So if people are having trouble making ends meet, which is the unfortunate situation for much larger portions of the population, consume less. That sounds trite, to some extent it is, but it's also thinking again, not to move away from what the others brilliantly articulated, it's just to say, giving something different. As an individual, can I actually save myself money and consume less? Do I have the privilege of having time to volunteer locally? doesn't necessarily need to be an official group. It can simply be knocking on the door of my neighbor and saying, look, what do you need? Can we barter? Can we exchange? Can we help each other out with time rather than products? Or maybe there is a local group which is useful. As was mentioned, is it possible to get on the phone to the local counselor and say, can we introduce traffic calming measures? Not for the whole parish, not for the whole area, just for your street. Of course, there are issues about scaling up. But again, the point is we need the big picture. We need the wide ones. Also, what can and can we not do individually? Focusing on that. Same, inform ourselves. And this is where I come back to science. So we had a great comment in the chat about how useful timber and stone are compared to concrete. I'd be cautious because if places don't have timber or stone nearby, the overall life cycle cost can actually be far, far more for timber and stone even after the 2004 tsunami, where bits of Aceh, Indonesia were devastated, and that included the forests. Traditionally, they built in timber using local trees. What they decided to do was rebuild parts in the traditional timber style, but the trees had been wiped out, so they actually had to import trees from across the ocean, which augmented deforestation in other areas. Same with the idea to launch nuclear waste into deep space. Aside from the risks, Aside from the ethics, think of the energy cost, which it requires to get to outer space. So we need the ideas. This is not to denigrate what's being said, throw them out, challenge us. But at an individual level, 
find the numbers, find the science. And to me, often it comes down to a balance. There are very few absolutes, including that absolute statement. Often it's very local, very contextual. Some places prefer timber, some prefer stone, some prefer concrete, some prefer a combination. And I'll throw one out there for people to find numbers and to perhaps demystify it. Limestone uses CO2. Hypothetically, it's probably not a good idea to build everything in limestone, but if we did, how much CO2 would we draw down from the air? Just like growing trees to build timber draws down CO2 from the air. Thank you. Okay. Can I, can I say, Great. Joel, something very simple that we can do? All of these panelists, these amazing people, have given up their time to educate you. So I'm going to put in the chat there's no CO2 link. If you just share it, you could change somebody's subconscious to make a different decision. Even if they only consume five minutes of this video, this is, this is absolutely amazing to share all this knowledge to your friends and family. Sorry, Charles. That's something yeah, very great. simple. Just to pick up on that, Gary, um, so basically a, a one-time a one -time donation of 30 pounds will plant enough trees to remove a ton of CO2 for every year those trees are growing. So just to give you an idea. But to, to come back to the discussion that we were having at the beginning about the G7, um, Elise mentioned this. So the, the flow, the decision-making flow from the G7 have said yes to, to, to 1.5, caveated as this group has said earlier. The next group is the G20 followed by that COP26, which is the, the 200 countries of the world. So let's just talk a little bit about and be practical about this. I mean, what, what is the mechanism? What's the way that having got the G7 to agree to this, and the G7 represents, I don't know, 25% of global CO2, plus the G7 plus the EU represents 25% or something or, or more of global CO2. How, how does the world, how, how does the world get the, the, the G7 to persuade the G20? And what role, what role do, do we have, whether it's people on the street or whether it's people who've got in, in more privileged positions about situations, what, what's, the, what's the thing to do to, to get the, the G7 uh, to move to the G20? So, S Stefan, do you want to kick this one off and then we'll, then we'll come to, to Elise in a minute? Stefan, do you want to have a go at this one? On, on the G20? Yeah, how does the G7, the G7 has agreed in its own way to, to 1.5, limit global warming to 1.5 max. So how then does the world move this agreement to get the G20 to agree the same thing? Yes, so my understanding is that in fact, the, the G7 countries are the, the largest emitters um, and um, of course, the, the, the G20 countries are uh, also um, uh, growing um, em emitters. So um, I believe that um, climate diplomacy exists. So the G7 agreement can lead uh, other countries to, to follow suit. And, and whatever can be achieved now is useful. I think that the G20 countries will monitor what the G7 countries are actually doing. And here we have an issue which is leading by example. If the G7 country lives up to its commitment, I think that the G20 following will be a, a no-brainer. Uh, but they, they won't commit now. They, they will uh, try to first evaluate whether the G7 countries are serious about uh, the, their uh, pro uh, proclaimed targets. Well, I, I would just add here, Stefan, that for me, a lot of this is about calling out now, calling out people who are, are not part of this. So without mentioning countries, we, I think all of us here know that there are certain countries maybe who are going to be more reluctant uh, to do something here. But for me, you know, the, we now know that the um, news lasts forever. You know, it, it's not like it was, you know, years ago when... Uh, something written on a piece of paper accidentally got lost in a library and never reappeared. Now, what people say is is public and is going to be uh, is going to be on the record forever. And so, for me, I think that the power of calling out uh, countries who who don't follow this, as those countries who are um, those countries who are, are not doing their bit, 
and that basically they're voting against they're voting against stopping global warming they're voting to wreck the planet it is a is a seems a powerful argument but i'm not an expert on this and elise i think um, i think you are you are so what what do you think of this one elise yeah so actually i must say the the g7 track and the g20 track are separate of course, there is some interaction because what's happening at the G7 has some political influence, but it's actually two separate tracks of negotiations. Uh, what's important to know, you, I'm sure you know that, is the G20 presidency is now Italy. So I would start by really targeting Italy as the, the presidency. Uh, we, we, are, we are actually in touch with the G20 uh, presidency in Italy, with the... Uh, what we call the Sherpas, who are in, in charge of drafting language for heads of states. And something we've asked them to do is to, um, to do a, a, an analysis of the climate and nature component of all the public funding and the stimulus packages that are, because as you know, now with COVID-19, there's a huge amount of money that's being put on the table for the, the economic recovery. And it's very, very important. I would say it's even more important than COP26 or the NDCs to look at how the money is going to be spent in the next 18 months. There's a very short window of opportunity there to avoid going back to business as usual, to really look at a green recovery that puts nature, climate, and people at the heart of this recovery. Um, so I would target the Italian presidency. Uh, it's of course quite hard to influence Russia or Saudi Arabia, but at least also try to influence your own leaders, your head of state in the, in the UK. Um, you can send letters, you can do Twitter storms, you can, you can do many things and I think everything counts. You can do things on the social media. Most of the heads of states actually have a Twitter account. So of course the G20 itself is impossible to, you won't be able to go to the G20 summit. I was myself at the G20 summit in France in 2012, and it was hiding with a press badge and going through security five times a day. Uh, but now with online, you can do a lot of action online that actually, that's actually quite effective. Um, you can also try to join other groups. I think it's much better. You know, we're stronger together. There's Avaz, for example, or the online groups that are quite powerful so try to see what they are doing and try to join their effort and support their effort okay excellent i mean the uh i read that the presidency of the cop of um the g20 rotates to indonesia and um, i read that uh, alok sharma was in indonesia uh talking with them only just a few days ago so would anybody else like to, uh, to chip in and comment on this question of, of G7 influencing G20? Anybody else like to comment on that? Or sure, sure I'll do that. Want... Yeah, I, I, I'd sort of raise my hand, but uh, I'll sure. jump in since you've offered. I think actually Jenny hit it. In the chat, she put the court issue. And as parallel tracks, not to go away from what the other two have said, but as parallel tracks going through courts is shown to be increasingly effective. I have no right to tell the Australian people what to do. They had a very clear choice in the last election and they made the choice in effect based on a pro coal platform and a platform to avoid climate change. That's democracy. On the other hand, governments are accountable to countries' constitutions and to countries' courts. So we've seen that court decision in Australia, which Jenny mentioned. We've seen the court decision against Royal Dutch Shell, uh, against Shell. We've seen others, particularly as Jenny mentioned, children taking their countries to court and there are several cases pending. So should we criticize, criticize Switzerland? That's democracy. They made their choice. But democracy is accountable to the legal mechanisms in place. So in addition to influencing our local areas, in addition to the tweet storms and trying to influence national leaders, going down the, lit lit the legal route is one way to ensure that democratically elected governments and democratic processes are held accountable. Okay, thank you. Now we've got a si the situation. So Elise needs to leave in just a few minutes. And um, the situation in Switzerland, I, I think the basically what's happened there very simply is people, people weren't aware there was a referendum over the weekend uh, and the referendum said no to some policies on, on climate. And the press simplistically said that the reason for that was to do with cost. 
So all of the, uh, the G7 uh, countries, all of those have got to get through the situation of, of costs of climate change and their democracies. So they've got to get this through their, their people. So if we can cut straight before you go, Elise, if you uh, cut through to, to your insights, please, on um, basically what are, what are the learnings specifically about how to position the issue of cost in, in other democracies like the UK, France, whatever, wherever, all those sort of countries. What, what's, your, um, what's your advanced learning two days after, two days after <laughs> the situation? Yes, thank you. It was such a disappointing day. And uh, because according to the polls, the, the yes was ahead with 60%. And I think people got really scared. As I said before, there was a very populist campaign. And I think one of the key learnings is uh, direct democracy is not always the most effective tool for policymaking. And we had a legislation that was crafted, carefully crafted by uh, members of the parliament. Uh, there was another attempt, by the way, in 2017 that failed. And because uh, the left wing and the Greens and you on the street said it was not ambitious enough. So then there was this new attempt to design a law and um, it was actually voted by the federal uh, government, by the executive power and by the parliament uh, with a very, very big majority. And it's actually the lobby of oil and uh, car manufacturing that decided to launch an initiative for a referendum, to put this law to a referendum. And I think that was very sad, uh, very, uh, actually an attempt to destroy it. Um, so I want to be very clear in terms of where this came from. And, uh, and there was a very simplified campaign there saying people would pay more tax. Um, so people got really afraid. And uh, actually the reality is that the victory of the no is um, the people who are losing out uh, of, from this, uh, this, uh, this failure are actually the poorest people uh, because there was a redistribution mechanism. Well, first, first of all, first, because uh, the poorest people are the ones uh, suffering from the impacts of climate change. And honestly, if Swiss people can't afford a 30 franc uh, tax on their air tickets, I don't know who else around the world can afford that. The money from the air tickets was going to go to a solidarity fund uh, for, uh, as I said before, health insurance and also to support uh, insulation on housing, etc. So um, I'm just going to show that very quickly and before I go, and I'm sorry that I can't stay, but... Um, really, should, should I write to the Swiss ambassador in London? To say, <laughs> yes. So um, I don't know if you can see now. Uh, I, it's in French, but I, see, I think you can see the figures because, Charles, you asked me about this today. Yeah. So I went back into the very precise figure. What you can see there on the top right is people with a low income and low energy consumption would actually get between 180 and 720 francs back every, every year in terms of support. Uh, people with uh, low income, but some more energy consumption, for example, using a, a four wheel drive or uh, you know, heating up the, uh, the house with uh, fossil fuel energy, they would only pay between 13 and 61 francs a year. People with, um, uh, with a low level of energy consumption, but higher income would also get some money back. And so this is just to say that the problem with the referendum, it's, it, it's simplifying the whole thing, you know? And I think it just came down to this issue that people that were not well it educated first about the climate emergency of why it is important, but also about the details of the law, which is a 40 page document. They came to a vote and they, they thought, okay, I have to say yes or no to more tax. Of course, I would say no. And so, and I think this is what is really worrying about the rise of populism um, because uh, climate change is very complex. And I do think sometimes we have to trust our government and members of the parliament to, to solve it. And uh, so direct democracy is not always good because it can be, I would say it was taken into hostage by the fossil fuel industry, the car manufacturing is the industry and the extreme right. So very sad, but we're not going to give up. There's going to be another law. Uh, the problem is we're losing time. 
because all the time it will take two or three years to craft another law and and you know carbon emissions are still increasing here in switzerland so <laughs> And the other challenge is actually the youth activists in Geneva voted no because they said the law was not going far enough. And so now you've got this extreme, you know, the, you have the extreme right and in a way the extreme left and the youth activists saying it's not, it's not good enough. And how do you bring all these people back on board together? That's going to be the challenge. <laughs> okay, well, so... Um... Any final comment, any final advice for the rest of us, Elise, before you go? Uh, no, well, thank you so much for, for hosting this, this event. Um, and no, as we said before, um, do vote, do mobilize people around you and take action as well yourself. And no, maybe one thing I would say, Charles, um, climate change is very, it can bring a lot of anxiety. Uh, so also take care about, about your, yourself, your personal balance. And um, so I would say this is the other part, the more individual ecology is also important. Um, go into nature, spend time with your family, take care of yourself the way you would take care of the planet. <laughs> okay. okay. We, should acknowledge you. we should acknowledge you and you can come back again anytime you like. Well, thank, thank you so much. And so I must much, say, Elise. I am leaving because I just had my second shot of vaccination and I'm a bit tired. And uh, so <laughs> otherwise I would stay for another another hour for sure. But uh, okay. 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 Bye. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. So I think that is a, for me, what's happened in Switzerland is a, it's a dose of reality. You know, we, we were sitting reading the news, reading the G7 communique, all thinking, oh, this is looking good. And then right on the same day had this dose of reality. So let's just finish the discussion about cost because um, the, the essence of what the situation in Switzerland, what, uh, what Elise just talked about is that it, it comes down to, it comes down to cost. So are we, are we worried about the cost? Um, is the same thing going to happen again? Um, are the ways that uh, are the ways of dealing with this? Um, anybody else like to like to talk on that uh, on that point? Yeah, so there's very few costs actually. Most of it is an investment. When we run the calculations, we find not only phenomenal financial long-term gains, but also short-term gains. And this is what really puzzled me. Well, one aspect among many which puzzled me from the G7 and the focus on the G7 was their commitment for $100 billion a year for, to help countries deal with climate change. We know that wasn't new money. We know it wasn't a new commitment. They were just trying to shore up commitments which they hadn't made. But surprising to say $100 billion a year is not that much money. I mean, it's certainly more than I make. When we look at what governments do for climate change though, direct subsidies to fossil fuel companies from our tax money is over $400 billion a year, sometimes hit 600. If we're talking about indirect subsidies, it is 10 times that amount. So we're not talking about spending $100 billion. I would say drop that pledge, spend zero, and give me back my $400 billion a year that you're giving to private companies to subsidize them. If we are going to stop climate change, we are going to save so much money, we won't know how to spend it. Okay, now that's the massive insight there, um, Ilan. So first of all, the idea that the spending is not spending, it's an investment. I think that's a very interesting mindset change. And maybe we need to bring, bring Pete in on that. Um, secondly, the, 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 the 100 billion, the, the, there was a separate section in the, um, the G7 communique which talks specifically about ending subsidies on fossil fuels. Um, so that potentially could release that uh, 400 to $600 billion uh, a year, which Ilan has talked about. Um, so that, that would be very, very good news. But um, anybody else like to, uh, like, to, yes. like to talk on this? Yes, I, I have a very precise example to give. If, if I may, uh, it, it's the example of Corsica. Corsica is an island uh, which has 50% renewable power and 50% fuel power. Uh, 10 years ago, I proposed a plan whereby within 10 years, we would be able to reduce our yearly uh, fuel bill 
for electricity production, about 100 million euro per year, to zero within 10 years. There was no decision. So 10 years later, we, we are still paying every year 100 million euro of fossil fuel for electricity production when we have plenty of sun, plenty of hydropower, and, um, and we just need uh, some clever systems to, to store this power and also become actually a net exporter of electricity because we do have some um, connections with uh, Sardinia and Italy uh, that actually work only in the importing way when we could actually export. Uh, so instead of having to buy 100 million of fuel per year, we would be able to roughly even out uh, the, the, the cost. So it's just an investment plan of 10 years, spending 100 million per year on becoming completely uh, power uh, independent on, on electric power and even being able to export uh, to the neighboring uh, countries which, which actually need uh, clean electricity. So, so this just shows how indecisive politicians can be when it comes to making sensible, pragmatic decisions. And you know, uh, in the chat, I, I was making a, a comment on pragmatic decisions when, prag when pragmatic decisions lack. That's when disaster hits. And the disaster for the Corsican econ is the economy is simple. We, we keep paying 100 million euros per year to the fossil fuel industry for to, to remain dependent on, on it. Sure. So, I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. There should have so, been so a decision. Stephen, there is no decision. So, Stefan, the um, the G7 has obviously, you know, does that does that give a, a, a way that you can bring this same proposal, uh, update it, bring it back to to Corsica, and now get it agreed on the basis that it's a great idea and it's an investment, as um, as Ilan has said. I'm waiting for the original election, which is slated for the end of June, and I'll talk to the next president of the Corsican uh, Assembly, hopefully. Okay. But these decisions have to uh, have to be made at the top, and, and then there also needs to be public support, and that's very important because the G7 won't act if there is not enough public support. And, and I'm not talking about some public support. I've talked to really the top leaders of this world uh, at COP21, COP22, COP23, and they all told me the same thing. Look, Stefan, we want to act, but we can't when there are only 10 or 20 percent of the population supporting climate action and the other 80 percent sitting on their butt saying, we don't have money, we, we don't want to, to disinvest fossil fuels, we don't want to change business as usual. So I'm, I'm not angry, I'm just telling pe people, look, if there are only uh, 20 panelists and 300 people following this webinar who want to change the world, it's not going to work. Yeah. Elise said you, you need to convince the 3.5% of pioneers, but then you need to convince the 15% of the early adopters, and then you need to convince the 80% of people who do not have the power or, no, or, or the will to change. Okay, so Stefan, this is a massive point here. So we're, you know, we started off feeling pleased that the G7 had said something. And now you put it right the way down to earth that we need the millions of people across all of these countries actually to do something and say they want to stop global warming too. Okay, well, I've been trying to do that. Um, clearly, I need to work harder. But um, we've got a finance question on the table. So, Pete, would you like to chip in? So this is about the costs, yeah? Yeah. So Jamath Palihapitiya, who's like the bad boy of VC, he's, he's one of the big, um, very successful venture capitalists um, on the West Coast. He, he said, the world's first trillionaire is going to be made in climate change. So all of this money is flowing into climate change because people can see, wow, this, this is an, an incredible investment. People are monetizing it, which kind of makes me feel bad. But that, that kind of shows that, that, that this, is, this is not a charitable endeavor that we're talking about. We are talking really about investment. Um, climate tech uh, investments has kind of tripled. It's it's gone. It's three times bigger than AI investments ever was. Okay, so that's that's pretty interesting. If you're an investor, this is a really good space to be. But this is not just an investment in monetary terms. Um, I don't want to talk about Mark Carney again. I'm not just a fangirl for Mark Carney, although I do love him a lot. He's in in his latest book. He talks about how we we've got ourselves into a position where we're measuring everything that we value by this one measure, which is GDP, and that's such a shame. 
if only we could maximize for the other things that we value as well. Well, the thing is, people who, who, who create climate tech companies are generally interested in like everything that the UN SDGs stand for. And if, you, if we are to pull off all of the things that we need to pull off in order to solve the climate emergency, then all of these other things that we value are gonna be, are going to be brought forth as well. So we are gonna live in a world where there are more trees, the, the oceans are teeming again, there's, you know, there's great jobs for everybody. The education of girls has gone up. Um, and that's, that's the kind of, we're not just investing to get a return on our investments. We're investing in the world that we want our children to live in. Okay. Well, I'm glad you've, um, I'm glad you've read and can understand the Mark Carney things. Um, sadly, he does, he does lose me a little bit. I can understand the Bill Gates one, but the, 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 the Mark Carney one needs a little bit more understanding for me. But um, just on, on this subject, um, what I'd like to table myself is what I thought was a very, very interesting point. So, uh, so Fatih Birol is the um, president of the uh, IEA, International Energy Association. And what he said in a um, recent article, he said that basically it doesn't matter where you remove the CO2, where you cut, where you cut the CO2. It doesn't matter whether you're doing it in London or in um, uh, or, or in a developing country, you're still making that cut. And he made, went on to make the point that it's actually cheaper to cut CO2 emissions in developing countries than it is in, in developed countries. So the data that I have to hand is that it's actually much, much cheaper to plant a tree in a, de in a developing country. So to plant a tree in Madagascar or Indonesia, uh, it's 12 times cheaper um, than in the than in the UK. So we need trees in the UK. But as I say, if your objective is to remove CO2 emissions, then um, you should be planting trees on the, the the 500 million hectares which are in the tropics first before you start planting them in North America, Canada, or, or the UK. But the a quick look at the data on um, on the cost of of, uh, of cutting CO2 emissions is that it's probably half the price. So if you look at the cost of wind power and solar power and nuclear power in, um, in, in outside developed countries, it's probably about half. So just want to put to, to people the idea, it, it, is this a value? If we, can cut, um, if we can cut CO2 emissions more cheaply by making developments in developing countries, um, I had my eye on the, unlike uh, Ilan, I had my eye on the $100 billion from the developed world moving to the developing world as a, as a source of financing, pump priming financing this. Is this, a, is this a viable idea? Does this help if we, if we cut CO2 emissions in developing countries? Does that help? I mean, who'd like to talk on that one? Uh, Jenny has her hand up. Hi, um, I think it's a really interesting um, debate because we have a finite area of land on, on our Earth's surface and I, there's the competing challenge of maintaining biodiversity and we should not forget that biodiversity doesn't just exist in forests. Biodiversity exists in savannas, biodiversity exists in peat bogs, biodiversity exists in marine habitats and we can't assume that we can cover the area of, of, of land where uh, that is that is not yet forested in trees um, if we also want to maintain biodiversity. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a very, very tricky balancing the carbon sequestration of um, forests versus uh, also considering biodiversity. Um, there's been a lot of interesting work done by Kew Gardens about this, who've recently published um, sort of 10 golden rules mm. for um, reforestation that I think are really interesting to consider. They've, they've really thought holistically about it. And I think that document is a good um, go-to when we're thinking about planting trees. Okay, um, I'm very happy that we, we do all of these things. The marine environment, I think is very important. There's a potential for um, uh, for seagrasses to to sequester a lot of stuff. Um, the the when I when I talk about the 500 million hectares for planting trees, this is actually land that's been deforested. So it, it's it's maybe removing some land which is being used to grow soya 
in Brazil and places like this, but this this is not taking yeah. away land. This is all land that used to be deforested. Yeah, um, that land has been deforested for human use. So we go back to this issue of a sustainable human population that we as humans are going to be eating food. We need space to live. We need fuel. Um, and if, if those come from, if we use the land that was previously forested land, then we have to consider a sustainable human population in part of this conversation. Sure. Okay, so maybe the 500 million um, hectares comes comes down a bit. So who else would like to talk to this point about the idea of um, the fatty barrel idea of, uh, of, of um, cutting the West, developed countries, um, cutting CO2 emissions in the uh, in the developing countries? Is this is this a value? Anybody else got a view on this one? I think that it's up to us to be working together. As per some of the back and forth in the chat, if unilateral decisions are made, we end up creating more problems than we solve. We're not out to hurt people. We're out to help us all. We've seen what happens when we cut international, intercontinental air travel overnight. We can do it. You know, but uh, two years ago, they were saying, oh, we can't do it. It's impossible. Well, we did it. But no one wanted it this way. This has not helped us. It has caused far more pain than any gains in the environment. So it's not about saying, oh, developed, developed. It's not the UN lingo of Annex 1, Annex 2. It's not us and them. It's not we tell you what to do, you do this for us. We're all human beings. Let's work together, do it together for everyone together. Okay, really powerful point. Thank you, Ilan. So um, we've got a few minutes left of the uh, of the time. Um, so anybody else like to to chip in with uh, with another idea? Yeah, I'd like to actually ask Pete that you mentioned uh, the possibility of the first trillion, what trillion dollar, trillion euro, trillion pound person. Isn't the fundamental structural concern that we are talking about one individual? owning a trillion whatever of assets? Isn't the fundamental structural concern that we've 2,095 billionaires in US dollars? Yeah, that is a big concern. Yeah, I use that example not because, you know, I think we should give all of our money to Jamath and, uh, and he will spend it wisely. Um, that, that was an illustration of the fact that, um, you know, it's, this, is, this is a profit-making thing and it's not a charitable endeavour. Um, I think the, you know, as, as money gets... I mean, you as you watch as you watch corporations approach like the, the trillion dollar uh, valuation of the book. Historically, they've been broken up, and they just wonder what happens to individuals <laughs> who are approaching the, the, the trillion dollar. Um, are they going to be broken up? Who knows? I mean, pe people say that the Jeff Bezos now has enough money to solve climate change by himself, doesn't he? With his, um, I, I see lots of people shaking their head there. That's not the number that I get from from uh, reading Drawdown. Uh, my understanding of Bezos is his net worth is 177 billion, which is still one third of what we subsidize fossil fuel companies every year. Well, Charles, there's, there's only 10 minutes to run and, and I'd love to hear just a recap of uh, where our amazing panelists, where, where they'd like to see uh, our planet at the end of the year, where, where, where they'd like to see change. Um, if, if we if we just do two minutes each, we're at the end. Yeah. So uh, rather than the end of the year, um, guys, let, let's position it. That, that's a great question, Gary. As always, um, let's position it. Where where would you like to see us at the end of uh, at the end of COP twenty six? Because this is the big decision making point. So where where would you like to see us at the end of COP twenty six? And what do we need to do to get there? Maybe um, two minutes. Who'd like to go first? Oh. Jenny, you're smiling. You keep picking on me, Charles. Um, I would like to see a real shift in behavior change because we need people to want to make this change. That needs to come from the change being financially viable. I am strongly, strongly of the belief that when the environmentally friendly options become cheaper than non-environmentally friendly options, um, people will flock to them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I want the bottom up behavioral change. I want these behavioral changes to become the norm, um, just in the way that going back to the analogy of smoking, smoking whilst pregnant, for example, is now considered just something that you don't do. I want that to be uh, 
flying for a holiday. I, personally, I think that we need to have this real shift in mentality um, from the bottom up, which will also hopefully be matched by some top down change. Um, I think the big problems we face there are a tragedy of the commons and the obsession with capitalist growth and the assumption that an, a drop in emissions is going to reduce, reduce well-being, reduce jobs, which I think that that fallacy needs to be challenged. So, so the that. thing is, Jenny, is, is you keep on being so great at answering these questions, it doesn't matter you going first. You don't seem to need the time to think about this stuff. OK, who's next? Please, was that you? Can I pay Jenny a compliment? All of us was very, very credible. I think that the brand of um, climate change has changed a lot. It's not people um, ch chaining themselves to boats anymore. It's very, very credible. Everything that's been spoken about today is um, very professional. And, and I think that the, the passion will take the message really far. So I want to thank every single person on this, on this panel. Um, for, for how, how your communication has been today. And, and it really, we've changed the world and um, you guys are changing it. You're leaders in what you say. Thank you, Gary. Mean so it. Pete, it's giving you a little bit more time for your answer, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna live up to that now, aren't I? So I'd, I'd like to see us become less macho uh, about the, the way that we, you know, eating meat. I'm not never gonna eat meat, yeah, I'm a man. I like to eat meat, macho. I like to drive petrol cars. You know, I've got a V8. I love it. I would, I'd like, you know, I've got a jet set setting lifestyle. I've got loads of money. I think, you know, I want to see us become less matchy. Um, I'd like to see us take more risk <clears throat> so that, you know, coming back to the, the, the idea that um, a lot of the things that we need haven't been invented yet. I think as an organ, as, as a species, we need to try lots of different things with, with the idea that, you know, many of them will fail, but it's okay to fail. If we look at how innovation works in, in places where it's done successfully, it is test and learn. It's learning by doing. Um, <clears throat> I think we should back the founders who who are struggling, who've got the amazing ideas that could potentially, um, you know, have a gigas on scale impact. Um, and then I think I think I'd really like to us to see us redesign money. And I think I think we've got a chance of pulling that off, right? Because we're just starting to realise. Hang on, that we're in this mess because capitalism is essentially a machine for generating climate change. We're, we're coming to that realization just as we're re revising what is money with the whole cryptocurrency thing. So I'm actually cautiously optimistic to see what they produce and to see if they can come up with a mechanism that allows us to optimize not just for GDP, but for the other things that we value too. Okay, thank you. So Stefan. Uh, yes, please, uh, back us, uh, back the founders, <laughs> Pete. Uh, so just, just kidding. Um, yes, I, th I think the, 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 this massive reinvest or disinvest uh, movement is very good news. Um, yeah, we've, we've seen and heard lots of declarations that we dreamt of during COP21, COP22, COP23, even the COP24, the, the mood wasn't there. Uh, only since COP25 have we started uh, to, to hear uh, um, nice messages. Uh, of course, now this year, everything is different. The US uh, are back. And, and that means uh, we, we can have a, a powerful G7 drive towards um, net zero. And this uh, is supported also by other public bodies and organizations. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting to see more public support for this. The, the, the COP26, it's not just about uh, asking the governments to do the job for ourselves. Uh, we, we need to be there. We, we, the people need to be there at COP26. And it's a great opportunity for the UK and uh, the, all the British and, and people from all over the world to, to meet also, um, whether virtually or in person. Uh, okay, you're going to have to find a way to compensate all this uh, travel and air travel and everything. And I think those CO2 is a great way to do it. Um, we can we can help. Okay, if you have to, if you think you have to go to Glasgow, do it. Okay, so Ilan. For me, it's not about one issue. What I would like to see by the end of the year is a lot more balance. 
and a lot more open, intriguing, useful discussion, which you're doing here, Charles and Gary, and bringing people on. And the chat, the questions and answers have been wonderful because in theory, we're brought here as experts. I have no idea what that means. I'm just a human being like everyone in the audience. I make mistakes. I hopefully have something to offer just like everyone in the audience. And so it's really saying we need balance. It's not about a single topic like climate change. We have to bring in equity and justice and racism and sexism and marginalization and discrimination and oppression and all the other aspects. Because if we only focus on one, we're not going to achieve the appropriate balance. We're not going to achieve the ultimate end goal. And we've done very well often at talking about generalities and principles, but as per one of the opening questions, but what do we mean? What are we going to do? And one of the closing comments here, a lot is in the details. So by the end of the year, I'd like to see a lot more people engaging in exactly this way in a much more of a round table rather than sort of panelists and audience, but really getting down to what do the numbers say? What can we not quantify? What does it mean to reduce flying by a certain amount? What does it mean to do what I said, reducing consumption by 10%? How do we deal with population numbers in a respectful and legitimate manner? How do we ensure that we're working locally, such as University College London seeking to rewild Bloomsbury in central London, for example, rather than it being simply a concrete jungle? So by the end of the year, everyone to join together to achieve balance, and to really start looking at, exchanging, critiquing each other with regards to the details for actions. Thank you. Super, thank you for that. Okay, so um, what do I want to see at the end of uh, the end of COP26? I mean, certainly I, I want to see the 1.5 decision. I appreciate it's, it's one aspect of this. I, I wanna see the 1.5 decision. Uh, and also the, the the 30 by 30 nature decision. I, I want to see those consolidated by uh, uh, by by COP26. Um, but there's something in the the G7 document which I think is is very simple and it, it doesn't have a lot of the complexity that we've been focusing on today. It's just very simply we acknowledge our duty to safeguard the planet for future generations. And for me, if every government in the world um, the leaders of every government in the world focused on that, acknowledging their duty to safeguard the planet for future generations, uh, I think we would move forward a lot. So Ilan has made some really, really great points about many of the dimensions of this that are missing. Um, certainly the thing that I think was hugely missing from what the, um, what the G7 had to say was that, that they give the impression that they can do this themselves. And for me, absolutely, they can't. And um, Antonio Guterres, head of the UN, has said that he that everyone has a part to play. Alok Sharma, um, president of COP26, has picked up on this wording as well. And I think they would have been COP, COP G7 would have been very, 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 very well advised to have um, also said that everyone needs to do their bit. So that's my message here. Everyone needs to do their bit. Stefan put it very, very well earlier, which is that the um, world leaders are not going to do any more unless they feel they've got some support from their back. And um, just coming back to what I said at the beginning, yeah, there's been some terrific ideas on this, this panel here today. I've no idea we were going to cover so much, so widely and so deep. There must be ideas here that people could do. I would really encourage people to pick up on one or two of these ideas to follow them through. If you're not sure what to do, it's very, very simple. As Gary said earlier, it's very, very simple to plant some trees. Please do what you are inspired to do. And I would also appeal to everybody on the, uh, the live and also on the, uh, the replay, do make contact with us on LinkedIn, make contact with everybody here, follow this up because we can really make a difference with our own with our own movement and we need to do that so we've got um we've got july august september and october we've got four months more of this to go and i really hope we can make a a, a big big difference okay so uh gary that's me yeah um <laughs> we're at the end uh it's really simple to plant trees don't think it's complex look into the no co2 website and um, the answers have 
let's leave them to nature and uh, humans step away, let's diversify. Uh, and the answer is really, if we leave it to mother nature, it will, it will sort itself out, but we do need to take action. Thank you everyone for your wisdom. And I look forward to the next 15 um, and our next um, webinar. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everybody. Super. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, to our, thanks to our live audience. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks Charles. Everybody. Stay safe until next month. Make a difference.